Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. This point earlier, and I really like it. This whole thing is about Sarah just stuff a hell. But um, you know, when it comes to white apologists, white apologists want to sort of wipe, um, whitewash history. They want to pretend like the Pilgrims. They want to pretend like you know DeSoto and Columbus. Like none of them actually had shit to do with the fucking massive genocide. Ten million, a hundred million people wiped off the fucking planet. Gone. Wiped out. Why? You know, they outright, there is widow woman, and they killed a lot of fucking people, but then they'll say, well, 80% or 90% of them was by diseases. Oh, my God, get the fuck out of here. The Wampanoags, they said that most of them were wiped out the Patuxic, you know, when the pilgrims came, they're all gone. Well, guess what? There was, you know, George Wymouth and John Smith. They're explorers in the Patuxic lands beforehand. They got slaves. They were going around murdering people. And um, guess what? Guess what the diseases were? You have, you know, you got smallpox. But you also have gonorrhea and syphilis. Well, how is gonorrhea and syphilis spread? How is gonorrhea and syphilis spread? The way it spread is through, you know, sex. It's an STD. It's a sexually transmitted disease. And I guess what? They were asking for it by what they were wearing. Get the fuck out of here. They were raped. The Native Americans were raped. They were being enslaved. They were being murdered. They were being pillaged. They, you know, valuables were being taken. They were looking for gold and silver. So that's what the point of these conquistadors, these were corporations. The pilgrims were a corporation. So they wanted to not just establish. It wasn't just a fun little adventure. Hey, let's just go set up a little colony in the middle of nowhere and see if we can do okay. They wanted to make money from these colonies. That was the point. So, you know, the, the financiers, here's a ship, here's some money, here's some supplies, go set up a colony, and then figure out a way to pay us some money. Jamestown succeeded because tobacco, they figured out a strain of tobacco that was sweeter or better, and it grew really well. That was the way that Jamestown survived, because once they figured out something that they can make and produce and ship back and make some money, so now you got this trade that's going on. So they made money. And it was a capitalistic endeavor. You know, it was, that's the, that was the point of them being there. So to pretend as if the diseases weren't brought by the white people or the gonorrhea, the syphilis, the gonorrhea and the syphilis was brought by the, you know, white people, by the conquistadors and by the explorers. So, you know, your DeSantos, your Pizarro's, your Cortez, no, I'm not going to fucking excuse them because it's just, oh, it's all diseases. Nah, fuck you. Fuck that. That's some bullshit. That's just some apologist bullshit. It's gonorrhea and syphilis. It's STD. It's biological warfare. They're going around raping them. They're giving them fucking diseases, and then they're, you know, they have sex with their people, and then now they're all fucking dead. Why? Because of the raping. So don't tell me that the fucking diseases and, you know, the 80% or whatever, well, it doesn't really matter because, you know, they died by diseases. Um, you know, 10,000 years they've been here for 10,000 years. Native Americans have been here the longest time. 10 to 100 million Native Americans were wiped out. One of the biggest genocides in all world history, the entire world history, but Native Americans were here for 10,000 years. And fucking clotter, you know, some of these apologists were like, well, even the natives were immigrants because of the Bering Strait or they come over by boats. Oh, my God. If being here for 10 years doesn't give you, you know, some sort of leeway, get the fuck out of here. <clears throat> There's people that's in America that's only been here for, what, 30 years? You know, they've just been born here just a couple fucking decades, and they look, well, I'm born here, so I'm, I've been here forever. No, you haven't. Uh, you've been here for about 200 years. Uh, America, 250, 240, Kentucky, 220, and then all the other states west of Kentucky has been here less than, you know, 220 years. So just because white people have been here for about 200 years and Native Americans have been here about 10,000 years, well, look, just do the math. That means in the span of human history, Native Americans have been here 98% of the time. 98% of the time, Native Americans have been here. 2% of the time, you've had these European invaders and their descendants, okay? So if 200 years, if... Just a, one generation means that this is your homeland, 10,000 fucking years, 98% of the time, this has been the Native American homeland. So this is something that we do need to rectify. We do need to make this better. Thanksgiving has got to change. We've got to, you know, focus on the Native Americans. Most people don't even know who the chief 
of the Native Americans were. And then, you know, pilgrims, Indians, have a big fucking feast and food. Get the fuck out of here. You need to know where this shit comes from. If there was a holiday and we were just celebrating, you know, Hitler's uh, massacre of the Jews or some shit, and uh, you're like, oh, it doesn't matter about the origins. It's all about just fun and family. And no, no, no. If we're celebrating Hitler, Holocaust, and the Jews, we need to fucking stop that shit. We need to change it to either a day of mourning for the Jews or honor the Jews. Same thing with Thanksgiving. We've got to honor the Pequot, the Narragansetts, the, the Pickmuck or the Nickmuck and the uh, Wampanoags, the Poconets. We've got to honor them. Uh, there's got to be, you know, even the actual Thanksgiving was a multicultural experience. The whole community get together, not just these little family tribes, but the whole fucking community. And uh, foods, there's a lot of Native American foods. Native America was better with agriculture. They have better morals. You have, you know, uh, Native Americans were being raped, right, by the white men. But when Native Americans would kidnap the white women, they wouldn't rape them. They weren't raping them. And they also... Uh, when uh, uh, another good thing about Native Americans, you know, they're not rapists, but they're also not killing people while they sleep. They're not killing children while they sleep. The Mystic Massacre is some of the most disgusting fucking bullshit I've ever fucking seen. 700 old people, men, uh, old men, old women, and then women and children were sleeping, and they attacked the village and burned it and killed, like, every motherfucker except for maybe five. And they're like, you know, what God and Christianity going to say, oh, we got enough, you know, in the Bible able to defend what the fuck we was doing. Oh, that's good. Great Christianity there. You get, get to go into other fucking villages and kill sleeping people and kill babies. Well, that's fucked up, okay? Native Americans didn't do that. They were shocked by that brutality. They've never seen anything like it. So they're not raping the women when they would take the prisoners. They're not killing babies in the middle of the night while they sleep. You know, maybe that's the reason why they got fucking wiped out because the our origins, our founders were willing to be absolute vicious psychos. And that's not, you know, our origin story is drenched in blood. It is drenched in a slaughter fest. And I don't, I don't particularly like the origin being, you know, it doesn't move me. Pilgrims don't move me. I don't look at these, you know, with the ruffs and the fucking dress and the buckled hats and shit, and that's not even true either. But I don't look at them and I say those are me. They're not fucking me. That, that's not who represents me. I don't give a fuck. I think it's bullshit. I think it's wrong, and I'm not going to go along with this charade, this charade. And there can't be justice on stolen land. We need to bury the hatchet with the Native Americans and with black folks. I think reparations is one good way, but I would settle just for a goddamn apology, an acknowledgement of who they are, who they were, what they stood for. Let's have that conversation. I, you know, I would like that. And folks might get on me about this. But you don't see the consequences today. You don't see how that affects who we are today. America is an empire, 900 military bases in 150 countries. We started out imperialistic, taking other people's lands and resources, and then kept going out west, and then we expanded to a colony. What happens when we don't have any more land and people and raw materials to fucking steal and exploit and take for ourselves? Then our business model would just collapse, right? No, we need to, you know, being a republic is better than being an empire. Being a republic means we just care about our own nation. Being an empire means we've got to police the entire world. At the same time, we've got to fucking exploit everybody. I don't think that's good. One million have been genocided in Iraq. One million are dead in Iraq, and that was, you know, that was fucking five years ago. The numbers probably have gone up even higher. But one million genocide. How come Americans don't give a shit? They don't give a fuck about Iraqi babies. They just, you know, uh, who gives a shit? My country love it or leave it. Fuck that. Fuck that. That's a death. That's a murder. And we've just created a whole bunch of fucking terrorists because of that genocide. And they didn't do anything to us. What, if we didn't go into Iraq, would we be speaking Iraqi right now? Oh, no. If we didn't invade Iraq, we'd all... No, there was no imminent threat. There was no imminent invasion. And they had no weapons of mass destruction. It was a fucking lie. And so it was about empires, about... Oil, Israel keeps on stealing Palestinian lands. How come we don't give a shit about that? Because we did the same fucking thing. And so if we don't acknowledge the native people's humanity, if we don't rectify the historical insults and the historical wrongs that we have done to past people, you know, that justice, if one of the Native Americans just flipped the fuck out and just started, you know, um, just gunning up the neighborhood, they would be just. They would be historically just in doing something like that. 
So, I mean, I, it, not only for my own self-interest, I don't want that to happen. We've been living here for so long, so we've got to figure out a way to, you know, make this all work. We should have started integration when we first got here. Since we didn't do that, then let's do it now. Instead, we're putting them on reservations, and they're like, you know, there's poverty and drunkenness and rapes and shit that's happening. That's bullshit. That is bullshit. So... You know, some folks want to talk about America losing her innocence. My God, America never had any innocence to begin with. We were birthed in bloodshed. Our origin story is a slaughter fest of Native Americans. We've been imperialistic from the onset, stealing other people's lands. And then when the empire collapses and there's no more lands to colonize people to exploit raw materials to steal Will the American business model hold up? We need to be able to be self-sustaining and hold ourselves up. The fact that the world uses our currency, China and Russia isn't using our currency, that matters. That's why, one of the reasons why we're able to be a wealthy country. But we can't keep doing that. That's not sustainable. So look at Germany. Germany isn't going around imperializing. They've been able to figure out how to make a republic work. So, you know, that's what Ben Franklin would give you a republic if you're going to try to keep it. Well, it's not a republic anymore. It's a fucking empire. And the president is not a king. He's an emperor. So the point of learning history, okay, at least to the late Howard Zinn, the author of the People's History of the United States, is to find those few individuals who courageously stood against all odds and succeeded. There's lots of dreadful things that have happened throughout all of history, and while those stories need to be told and remembered so that we don't repeat history, that's not the point of history. There's a lot of bad shit that's happened, and yes, we do need to rectify it, but the point is to root out those individuals, those heroes who actually showed us a path, uh, who stood up against insurmountable odds and proceeded courageously anyways and were victorious or not. You know, we don't want to repeat history, but, but there's, you know, Willis Russell of Owen County stood up, you know, virtually single-handedly against the KKK. Simon Gertie, you know, fought against the imperialism, and he lived to be an old man. The Weather Underground, I can't even believe that nobody mentioned the Weather Underground to me. And then we also have Sarah Josepha Hale. Sarah Josepha Hale is the reason why we have an American Thanksgiving. Sarah Josepha Hale is the reason why Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving. It's the reason why we have the traditions that we associate with the holiday. So not only did she get the holiday, she lobbied five presidents in order to get the holiday. She asked Miller Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, Zachary Taylor, and none of them did it. Eventually, Abraham Lincoln did it. So that's good for us, right? Um, it comes from Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Thanksgiving proclamation. That's why we got Thanksgiving today. Every sing it wasn't a national annual holiday until the Civil War. So it wasn't the Pilgrims started it and we've just been carrying this shit up. No. Uh, Abraham Lincoln started it in 63 as a Christian celebration. Nothing to do with the Pilgrims. And then eventually we added the Pilgrims, we added the turkey, we added all the you know pumpkin pie and all the shit later. These traditions were added to it. Abraham Lincoln wanted to bring the entire country together. It was a unity story, and the unity story, eventually the traditions go on top of the unity story. There was some mention about some turkeys, so let's throw some turkeys in, but everything else was an invention of Sarah Josepha Hale. And who is this Sarah Josepha Hale? She's a remarkable woman. So old honest, uh, old honest Abe was in the midst of a great bloody civil war because Americans are desperately in need of unity and inspiration. The myth of the first Thanksgiving was born to inspire and unite. Our modern cel celebrations date back only to 1863. Not until the 1890s did the pilgrims get included in the tradition. So for 40 years, Thanksgiving had nothing to do with pilgrims. And no one even called them pilgrims until the 1870s. So we started that too. Her first letter to Lincoln on the subject was mailed September 28, 1863, after reading it, thinking it over, October 3rd. So Lincoln's turnaround rate was like five days. He decided to, on um, you know, October 3rd, 1863, to declare the last Thursday in November as a national Thanksgiving holiday, which it became that same year. Prior to this, the only national holidays that had existed in the United States were Independence Day and Washington's birthday from that point on until the point when Congress officially set the date of Thanksgiving into U.S. law in 1941. Every U.S. president, with the exception of Roosevelt, would annually declare the last Thursday in November as a national holiday for giving thanks last. So the fourth Thursday of, you know, every November is Thanksgiving. 
because of Roosevelt trying to extend the Christmas shopping period. Sarah Josepha Hale was a remarkable woman, and in spite of her being against women's right to vote, she raised the bar of what women could achieve by example through her long rap sheet of accomplishments. Mary Had a Little Lamb. You ever heard of this song? Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb, Mary had a little lamb, fleece her white as snow. <laughs> Sarah Josepha Hale, the one who wrote it, and she sang it. Sarah Josepha Hale was the editor of the two of the most successful magazines in the United States, the Ladies Magazine and Gotti's Ladies Book. And this is in the 1860s when, you know, uh, Kentuckians don't even read. I heard a Kentuckian actually tell me the other day, uh, he was so bored he could read a book. You know, I think Kentuckians could learn from Sarah Josepha Hale. Uh, let's get more Sarah Josepha Hales out here. Uh, she wrote the book Northwood, Life, North and South, one of the first books that dealt directly with slavery as a central part of the plot. Also, one of the few books written by a woman at the time in America. She wrote this book shortly after her husband died, leaving her with very little money and five kids to raise. After his death, she started and ran a mil millinery business, making hats for women to support her family, raised the kids, and published a book of poems for extra money called The Genius of Oblivion and Other Original Poems. This book was initially only marginally successful, but it was enough to allow her to stop having to make hats and to focus on writing a novel. Her novel, Northwood, ended up being extremely successful and was eventually read by the Reverend John Blake, headmaster, uh, headmaster of the Cornhill School for Young Ladies. He was so impressed by her work that he offered her a position as the editor of a woman's magazine. He was starting called The Ladies Magazine. This made her the first ever female editor of a magazine in the United States. The first. That's, I mean, Sarah Josepha Hale isn't just the one who come up with Thanksgiving and Mary Had a Little Lamb. She's a remark. She's a, uh, one of the most accomplished people I've ever, you know, read about. With the first ever female editor of a magazine, Sarah Josepha Hale. She held this position for eight years before the magazine eventually merged with Gotti's Ladies Book, which specifically targeted um, the magazine Hale worked for acquisition because they wanted her as editor of the journal. She held the position of editor for this journal for 40 years with no significant competitors in the United States and with her writing nearly half the content for each journal in the beginning, both Gotti's Ladies Book and Hell had a surprising influence in the United States during her time as editor. Gotti's published on a huge range of topics, uh, not just specifically related to women, but also such random things as housing design, which many of Gotti's architectural house plans being popularly used by builders all over the country, you know, architecture. Sarah Joseph, Josepha Hale influenced architecture in America. Sarah Josepha Hale's influence can be seen throughout the United States during her lifetime, having a significant effect on how women dressed, what they cooked, what literature they read, how they conducted themselves morally, etc. Sort of the Martha Stewart, Oprah, even Michelle Obama of the day, she was tirelessly, uh, she tirelessly promoted education for women, eventually even helping to found the Sar College. The idea of a women's college at the time was looked upon, looked down upon in U.S. as formal education for women was still something frowned upon as a whole. Controversially, she convinced the Vassar, the women's college, Vassar College, to hire a female administrator and female teachers. Oh, it's a women's college, and they got female administrators and women teachers, something that was also never done at the time. So that's remarkable. The teaching profession, most of them are women today. In her spare time, she helped found the Siemens Aid Society in 1833 in Boston, which is an organization that helps women obtain useful job skills and also helps to support them by giving them a place to live and food to eat while they attempt to establish themselves. So she's, you know, setting up societies. Originally, the society was started to help those women whose husbands were lost at sea, leaving the surviving women and children typically destitute. If this isn't enough, she published nearly 50 volumes outside of what she produced for the journal uh, that she was editor for. These works were comprised of various novels and books of poetry. One such poetry book targeted at children produced the ever-popular Mary Had a Little Lamb, which was originally just called Mary's Lamb. On the side, she also edited several issues of popular gift book, The Opal. The Opal. I mean, it's a gift book. I don't know what the Opal's all about, but she edited it, right? So she's writing and editing like a crazy motherfucker. She's like Karl Marx, you know, with how much shit she's writing on you know, women's right to vote. I disagree with her, but her logic is sound that if she told me her explanation, I'd just be like, oh, well, I 
never looked at it that way. I couldn't argue with it because it's pretty sound logic, even though I disagree with her. So, you know, I negate, but it's logical. So Sarah Josepha Hale, she believed that America's women were the morality of the nation. So much to the chagrin of suffragists, Hale was a tireless supporter uh, of women's rights, particularly the right to an education, the right to work outside the home. She openly did not support the right for women to vote. She was openly against it. So she just was wrong on the issue, but she advocated for people, hey, don't do it. But her reasoning is that politics was all about trickery, lying, deceit, anger. In Sarah Josepha Hale's point of view, women should strive to be above such things, above trickery, lying, deceit, and anger. And they should be the moral compass for their families and combined for the nation itself. So not only were the moral, were they the women the moral compass for their family, but they were the moral compass for the entire nation. She felt that it was sufficient for women to influence political outcomes positively through being this moral compass for their husbands. Thus, they stay out of politics directly while still being a secret, silent influence and directly affecting the political arena. Getting directly involved in politics, in her view, would only serve to pollute the women's morals, which would ultimately hurt the nation when there was no longer anyone who was moral. I remember that did this uh, argument gender. If they get in power, how does it, you know, does a woman president or a woman prime minister differ in their behavior than a man prime uh, minister or a man leader? And it turns out people with power act very similarly. They, they're not that much different. So the, I, that's an interesting argument, what she's trying to make, you know, by being happy or homemaker and by being out of the sphere of politics, they don't get in the bloody mess of sort of trading punches and shit. Uh, but then they can just, you know, just be pleasant and be nice and not like that icky sort of tough politics stuff. And that does sort of keep their innocence, keep their purity, you know, intact. So, and I know some women that I feel like this reminds me of. So I'm in favor of women's right to vote. I'm a feminist. Uh, but it's a fascinating argument, you know. Uh, if a person does have to get in the war and do bad things, then who is to guide them and tell them, you know, the difference between right and wrong? And, you know, I, I think that if you're always pleasant and positive, then you would steer away from a lot of this sort of bullshit. Anyways, in 1877, Thomas Edison recorded Hale's children's poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb, with his phonograph, making it the very first recording ever. Mary Had a Little Lamb was the very first recording ever made. So that's Sarah Josepha Hale. She died two years later on April 30th, 1879. Uh, at 91 years old. Sarah Josepha Hale was a big part of getting the Bunker Hill Monument built. At one point, construction stalled due to lack of funds. When this happened, she asked each of her readers to don donate a dollar. She also organized a craft fair that lasted a week in Quincy Market. Through these efforts, she raised $30,000, three-fourths of a million dollars today, which ultimately allowed the monument to be finished. Similar efforts and editorials by her were also used to help get Mount Vernon preserved. Sarah Josepha Hale's parents believed, uh, both of them believed that women should be educated and saw to it that Sarah received an education even though she wasn't able to actually formally attend school. Rather, her parents homeschooled her. In the beginning, her advanced education was handled by her brother, Horatio. When Horatio attended Dartmouth, Dartmouth, he'd come home and teach her what he'd learned that day. And once he had done so, they'd study together. When her brother Horatio was awarded a diploma from Dartmouth, he awarded Sarah with a diploma from the Horatio Gates Buell College and declared that she had graduated summa cum laude with a degree in the arts. So Sarah's love for learning continued throughout her life and was reciprocated by David Hale, a lawyer whom she eventually married in 18. 13 at the age of 25 years old. David Hale died of pneumonia just nine years after they got married, 1822, leaving Sarah and their five children to fend for themselves. Five children in nine years. Interestingly, despite being the queen of fashion in her day, Hale only wore clothes that were black for the vast majority of her life. She was done, this was done as a sign of perpetual mourning of the loss of her husband. So she stayed loyal to her husband. You know, he died in pneumonia, so he was loyal to her. But she did that till the day she died from his death on for 67 years. She mourned his death for 67 years. Sarah Josepha Hale heavily cam campaigned for Elizabeth Blackwell to be able to become a doctor. At the time, there had never been a female doctor in America. With the help of Hale and others, Blackwell 
was ultimately allowed to become a physician. Sarah Josepha Hale also was a big supporter of people getting plenty of exercise and kids being allowed to play and made to stay in shape as she stated physical health and its attended cheerfulness promote a happy tone of moral feeling and they are quite indispensable to successful intelligent effort, intellectual effort. So being cheerful promotes a happy, let's see, let's hear that again. <laughs> this is like Michelle Obama, right? Martha Stewart or Oprah, Michelle Obama says she wanted people to get plenty of exercise, kids being allowed to play, made to stay in shape. The Germans brought gymnasiums. I don't know why we're not doing gymnasiums today, adult gymnasiums. Where do the adults go to, you know, just fucking restaurants to get fatter, go to fucking stores and buy shit? Let's go to gyms and, you know, get stronger. Why do we got to have a membership and shit? Let's have a central fucking gym that we all go to. As she stated, physical health and its attendant cheerfulness promote a happy tone of moral feeling, and they are quite indispensable to successful intellectual effort. The nearer transmitters are popping and percolating when you exercise. So she's absolutely right about that. Sarah Josepha Hale uh, didn't just get the National Day of Thanksgiving passed into law. She also kept on adding things to the holiday, most importantly, adding recipes to cook. As the editor of a magazine called Gotti's Lady Book, Sarah Josepha Hale came across Edward Winslow's writings about the feast in the 1840s. Uh, with, uh, when this editor, Sarah Josepha Hale, read Winslow's writings, she decided to bring this historic celebration back to life. Up until then, Thanksgiving was only a regional New England holiday and wasn't celebrated across the country like it is today. Sarah Josepha Hale began publishing recipes and articles about the feast. Shortly after, in 1854, Sarah Josepha Hale we heard about William Bradford's book of Plymouth Plantation, which had gone missing during the siege of Boston during the American Revolution. So William Bradford's entire fucking book about what the pilgrims did, you know, the first 30 years was gone. You know, the British had totally destroyed this book, and we wouldn't have known anything about this had uh, it not been rediscovered. And Hale, you know, Sarah Hale had, had been able to find it. And so it resurfaced in the library of Fulham Palace in London that year. Sarah Hale focused her attention on the brief sentence about the colonists' hunt for wild turkeys that fall. So there's only one thing we know about Thanksgiving, and that was that there was five white-tailed deer. But they did talk about other, you know, plants and animals that they had ate, fish, cod, shellfish, uh, lobster. Lobster would have been a fucking awesome Thanksgiving. I would love to have a lo lobster Thanksgiving. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, animals and plants that are indigenous to this continent, so that's actually taking what she had said and sort of expanding it to something bigger. Uh, William Bradford never said that there was turkey at that fucking dinner. He just said that there was wild turkeys around. So she went ahead and, you know, took it to a whole nother uh, level. Besides waterfowl, there is great store of wild turkeys, of which they took many, besides venison, etc. That's it. They just fucking mentioned that there was wild turkeys around. Uh, it had nothing to do with the feast, just that, you know, 1621 was a better year than the year half of everybody starved to death and died of disease. William Bradford wrote, you know, that that sentence, despite the fact that Bradford never stated that they ate turkey at the Thanksgiving feast, Sarah Hale started publishing an article about Thanksgiving dinners with roasted turkey, and the two became synonymous. So we wouldn't have Thanksgiving. We also wouldn't have turkey at Thanksgiving if it wasn't for Sarah Hale. Sarah Hale is the one who did all this. You want to know what the fuck is going on when it comes to Thanksgiving? Because the shit doesn't make any damn sense. Um, it's because Sarah Hale's lobbying in her campaign. She started we publishing articles about Thanksgiving dinners and recipes, and, you know, the turkey for her was absolutely essential. You must have a turkey at Thanksgiving. Today I was even told to have a happy turkey day. Obama served turkey. Obama pardoned the turkey. They've been doing that stupid turkey shit forever. And someone pointed out that genocide of the Native Americans genocide of turkey. That's a good connection, to be honest with you. Um, I'm a meat eater, but I do wonder, there is, I think Leo Tolstoy says, as long as there's slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields, and speciesism is the reason why we have, you know, as long as one group of organisms <laughs> think that they're above some other group, there will always be some type of hierarchy. The dead animals, their carcass tastes delicious, and, you know, I've been eating meat for, I don't know, if I could get around vegetarians that would be able, I could talk to and discuss what type of things to eat and have, you know, interesting things to eat, I would become vegetarian because it, the, my conscience, it fucking bothers the shit out of me. Look at these factory farms. 
it's okay for us to go to the store, buy a fucking, you know, plate of fucking hamburger and cook it here. You don't actually see the fucking animal living and getting their head chopped off and shit. But if you look at some of the videos of these um, factory farms and the abuse that they do to the, you know, and how they're fucking killing. I saw this one where they're supposed to, like, shoot this pig, the pigs, with something that sort of just, you know, numbs them and sedates them. And then when they slit their throat, then they don't know what's going on. But there is one video where the guy slit the throat and the, the fucking pig is just like, ooh, 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 you know, like a fucking animal that got its throat slit. That's what it fucking acts like. And it was just, it's disturbing. It's fucking disturbing. And so um, that's, you know, murder. And those people in slaughterhouses, that fuck with your head. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer started out with fucking cats and animals and shit that eventually moved on to bigger, better things. So uh, that just scares the shit out of me. Uh, what if they get some sadistic pleasure out of that? What if eventually, you know, it ain't nothing to fucking kill all these damned animals? Or what if it's, they love it, you know? What if they get a thrill out of it and then it's not enough? Hopefully they can, you know, tamper that psychopathic down and they could be, you know, a psychopath who doesn't turn serial killer. But I, that doesn't, I don't know, that's scary. That, bo that doesn't bode well for society. The people that work in slaughterhouses are probably really fucked up, to be honest with you. So, William Bradford also mentioned lobster and cod, Indian corn, succotash. And there's a lot of plants, actually. There's a ton of plants that are native and indigenous to this continent. Which is exciting. That's good stuff. I mean, the main staples, there's tomatoes and potatoes and corn, pumpkin, chocolate, vanilla, lots of shit that was native to this continent. And so if we could celebrate all things American, all things native to America, not just the uh, plants and the animals, because turkey is native to this continent too, and so is white-tailed deer, but also the Native Americans. I think turning this day into a celebration of the Pequod, Wopin, Wapinoag, Narragansetts, the Nipmucks, the Shawnee, Cherokee, Yuchi, you know, just go down the line, Cheyenne, uh, Sioux, just, <laughs> there's a million of them. There's a million of them. So I think that would be uh, a good advantage, a good positive step forward for this day. So Sarah Hale's contribution, let's see, Bradford mentioned lobster and cod, Indian corn, succotash. You know, we all want to know fucking succotash just because the pilgrim mentioned it. But lobster, lobster sounds delicious. Uh, and the only thing we know was that there was white-tailed deer at that military alliance and land acquisition celebration that we falsely call Thanksgiving. They didn't know, think it was a Thanksgiving. They didn't say it was a Thanksgiving. It's not a tradition after that fucking day. We added all these elements to Abraham Lincoln's general day of Thanksgiving of unity, and let's all stand together for some, you know, um, let's, let's, we're all Americans, right? Why North, South, fuck this Confederate shit. Let's be Americans. So Sarah Hale's contributions to Thanksgiving didn't stop there. She wrote numerous editorials that were widely circulated outlining various recipes to be used for Thanksgiving dinner. These recipes included many things that were not served at the original Thanksgiving but are traditional today because of her, such as the turkey, stuffing, pumpkin pie, cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes. That's Sarah Hale. Sarah Hale fucking created Thanksgiving. So the pilgrims and the Native Americans cute little story, but let's quit lying to ourselves and quit lying to our kids about what the fuck is actually going on. This is Sarah Hale's holiday. Sarah Hale is a remarkable woman. We could learn about her. You know, that's what her life is incredible. She wrote so much. She even influenced architecture and women's opinions and a lot of things. So an old Indian, an old Native American proverb is that when you speak the name of the dead to the earth, they're still alive. So, R.I.P. Me and Tanamo, R.I.P. Wittawamit, R.I.P. Massasoit, R.I.P. Squanto, R.I.P. Wamsutta, R.I.P. Sassicus, R.I.P. Tecumseh, R.I.P. Cornstalk, R.I.P. Pontiac, R.I.P. Maluntha, R.I.P. Sitting Bull, R.I.P. Geronimo, R.I.P. Crazy Horse, R.I.P. Sacagawea, R.I.P. Pocahontas, R.I.P. Blue Jacket, R.I.P. Red Stockings, R.I.P. Black Hawk, R.I.P., Dragon Canoe, R.I.P., Chief Plucky Mino T, R.I.P., Johnny Logan, R.I.P., Hiawatha, R.I.P., Metacomet, R.I.P., Metacoms, 
Uh, Metacomet's dignity and steadfastness both impressed and frightened the settlers who eventually demonized him as a menace they could not control. For 13 years, he kept the regions, towns, and villages on edge with the fear of an Indian uprising. And if the Indians would have united, Tecumseh tried to do it, but it was too late. But Metacom tried to, you know, he was talking about it, but he never initiated into plan. It was the pilgrims or the uh, Puritans that eventually started it. But here's a letter written by Metacomet. It's not really historically significant, but I'm going to read it now to bring Metacomet back to life. He knew English, apparently, to be able to write a letter. So this is my tribute to Metacomet. It's just a couple minutes after Thanksgiving, but I think that that's okay. I'm sure Metacomet wouldn't mind if he was alive today or tomorrow. Um, but here's Metacomet, okay? So Philip Satchem of Mount Hope to Captain Hope Still Foster of Dorchester sendeth greeting. Sir, you may please, uh, you may please to remember that when I last saw you at Wading River, you promised me six pounds in goods. Now my request is that you would send by this Indian five yards of white or light colored serge to make me a coat and a good holland shirt ready made and the pair of good Indian breeches, all which I have present need of. Therefore I pray, sir, fail not to send them and the several prices of them in silken buttons and seven, seven yards of gallon for trimming, not else at present to trouble you with, only the subscription of. King Philip, His Majesty, P.P. Mount Hope, the 15th of May, 1672. R.I.P. Metacomet, Happy Thanksgiving, Happy Gang Stephen. Let's do this fucking holiday right. Let's be, let's not be stupid about this stupid, you know, this dumb shit anymore. Being ignorant in the age of information is by choice. Fuck that. We got the internet. We're the new generation. We're smart. We're evolved. Let's, you know, Let's use our evolution to our advantage. Let's not try to dumb ourselves down. Let's smarten ourselves up. Smarten you. Smarten me. Just keep on getting better and smarter. You, you can never stop learning. You, you keep on getting wrinkles in your brains. And, uh, you know, just keep on keeping on, man. <laughs> so, John Masters, Grundy, Virginia. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Gang Stephen. Happy Sarah Hales. Thanksgiving Day. R.I.P. Sarah Hale. R.I.P. Sarah Hale. Peace.